All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, or maybe it's 4.02, I don't know. Uh, but whatever it is, it means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live session for Thursday, April 15th, the day formerly known as Tax Day in the United <laughs> States. It's optional Tax Day now. It's optional tax day. We debated that this morning on uh, Clubhouse about whether today, because of the uh, the extended deadline, is today really tax day? We don't know. It doesn't matter. That's I not to, what we're here to talk about. I did have to Google it just to be sure because I thought, I don't, maybe it is tax day because my computer kept telling me it was tax day. It was very insistent. But no, uh, it's optional. that's uh, Bill Gates's voice in your head. <laughs> for those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live session. This is our simulcast version of the Context and Clarity conversations that happen every weekday at 4 p.m. Eastern. This is also a podcast. If you're listening to this in the future, that's a very cool concept. What you're listening to is a recording that uh, Catherine McPhail and I host every Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, and on Twitch. We're joined every week by a special guest to talk about the things that matter most to architects, to find clarity around one topic every week that matter most to the success of architects. And so before I tell you who our special guest is today, I want to give you a little bit of a recap of our week, because many times we take the topic that we're going to discuss with our Thursday guest, and we use that to set a theme for the week, and we set topics for every day. The theme for the week is um, is managing expectations. It's one of the most popular conversations. It's one of the things that almost every conversation that happens within the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, it almost always boils down to some version of managing expectations. So that's where we are starting as a platform today. Over the course of the week, we started on Monday asking the question, what makes the best leader? How do you become the best leader? On Tuesday, we talked about being the best employee. And then yesterday, Wednesday, we talked about being the best colleague. So we sort of cloaked that idea of expectations and this idea of being the best, whatever that means. But we can't figure out what the best is if we don't know what the expectations are. So now we bring it around full circle. Mm -hmm. I see today. how that is. I was it wondering took, what the connection, now you, there you go. It, it took four days for me to explain what in the world we've been talking about all week. <laughs> That's good to know. Probably ought to make some <laughs> notes about that. It's just me. It's just me. It's not you, Jeff, I'm sure. No, I, it's it's probably everybody. Um, that, would be, that would be my guest. Uh, great to see some of you rolling in right now and making comments there in the comments section. Uh, we appreciate all of you being here. When you get here, say hi like Liz Sloan just did from Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, Chris Novelli, uh, Leslie, we see you down there in Brevard, North Carolina. Um, say hi when you get there, uh, when you get here, and let us know that you're here. There's a, uh, uh, what is that, a link that Catherine put down on the bottom of the screen right now. If you're on Facebook, because you're, you are in a private Facebook group, we can't see your name. It just says Facebook user. So if you would like to allow us to see your name, go to that uh, that link, chat.restream.io slash FB for Facebook and allow Facebook and uh, Restream to speak to each other. And then we'll see your name on the screen. If you're anywhere else, if you're on YouTube, if you're, if you're on uh, Twitch or uh, LinkedIn, we'll see your name. It's just a, just a function of privacy, uh, privacy policies. That's all that is. And you can choose to connect those two if you like. But we appreciate you being here. We really want to bring you into this conversation with our special guest this week. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your in advance for your questions and comments. And we're going to do our best to get those questions and comments into this conversation that we're about to have. Are we ready to jump into this? Me, yeah, I'm ready. You asking me? I'm. Okay. I've been here waiting a long time. I'm really excited. All right. Well, with that, I don't want to leave our guest waiting. He's in the green room right now. Just like last week, he didn't have any crazy requests or expectations for you know like red 
uh, <laughs> caramel M and M's or anything like that. So he's he's really easygoing. He's super easy to talk to. I'm really looking to this forward to this conversation. And so let me introduce him to you right now. Our guest today is a leader. He's a motivator. He's a mentor. He's no stranger to the world of architecture. In fact, he spent the past two decades consulting with and developing leaders in the A&E space and helping firms communicate better, lead better, and serve better. He's a self-proclaimed serial podcaster, and I say that, it's actually true. I don't know how many podcasts this guy has going right now uh, or at any one time, but he is a serial podcaster, and he's here to help you take baby steps and sometimes big steps so that you can become the best version of you. Randy Wilburn, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Thanks for joining us today. Man, thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Catherine. I really appreciate that. And I think you read it wrong. It's actually, he likes cereal and listens to podcasts. So I just like cereal and I like listening to podcasts. No, I, I am a cereal podcaster. I love podcasting. I've been doing it since 09. So it's kind of uh, in, in, in the blood at this point. So Awesome. I love that. You know, I can go back to the cereal piece. What's your favorite cereal? <laughs> Man, actually, you know, I've, I've grown out of the, the stuff back in growing up as a kid. I was a honeycomb kid and, and alphabets. Honeycomb, like I back was not going to guess that. I even forgot that existed. Yeah, no, I wasn't like a Count Chocula guy or anything like that, or Boo Berry or anything. I because mm -hmm. you know back, you know, it's so funny. I mean, we're of an age range where we remember all of the the sugary cereal commercials that would come <laughs> on on Saturday morning and in okay. the afternoons that would just you know cause you to bribe your mom to go buy some honeycombs or yeah. whatever. But that was it. So yeah, I, I yeah. loved uh, I loved honeycomb. So there's that a lot was of sugar. My one indulgence. Oh my yeah. gosh, a lot of sugar at the bottom of the box. You know how when you get at the very mm -hmm. bottom and you pour it in. <laughs> Yeah. All the sugar. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Now, oh, now they package up that sugar from the bottom of the box in its own little candy package. And you right. Buy that right. The concession right. stand at the game, right? Yeah. Um, I see somebody mentioning Raisin Bran. I mean, um, Christian yeah. Raisin Bran was that. That was there was always that one kid at school whose parents would only let them have Raisin Bran. <laughs> so that was it. So. <laughs> Yes. But it's all good. It's all good. The the, the raisins are are sweet. So yeah. yeah, you know the 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 problem the problem with starting off this conversation in this way is that the minute that you mentioned honeycomb kid is that <laughs> now that theme song that commercial. Oh, jingle. I can. I, it's in my head right now. I can <laughs> play it over. And I mean, those advert those those people, the people that advertise back in the day. I mean, they were geniuses when you think about how that stuff still sticks with you today. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, it, oh, yeah. Like we forty-five could, we years could, later. If I pressed any one of you, we could we could recant and re recite so many commercials that we grew oh, right. up on. Yep. I mean, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got the Kool-Aid one stuck in my head right now. Oh, I don't man. know why that yeah. popped Forget in. about it. Yeah, that's yeah. hilarious. So. Yeah. Oh, we, we can change that. Honeycomb Kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah but see, I guess right. that's a lot like the Kool-Aid because they also said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They did. Kool-Aid, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, oh yeah. yeah. So. Is Honeycomb great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that how it went? <laughs> Yes. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to spare you that. <laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. We yeah, we, that. we have a lot of discussions about raisins around here. So maybe we, um, yeah. and I know we could fill a whole hour with that. We're, we're, so, we're going to do an episode on cookies one day. Um, <laughs> that, that's no joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. We're going to have to yeah. do that. Yeah. So when, when you when you think about the jingle writers, and the, the honeycombs and the Kool-Aids and the, you know, the whatevers, um, they are geniuses at at writing the those. Uh, what, what's the word that I want? It, they're sticky, definitely, right? They they stick earworms. Their minds. Yeah. Say that again. Earworms. earworms. They're really earworms. good hooks. Yep. They just exactly really good the hooks. Hook. So. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And and what's funny about this whole conversation, I think today is um, when, like I said, we, we've been talking about expectations in a way all week. And it's funny that you said, you know, you hear that jingle and all of a sudden you're bribing your mom, right? You hear that jingle as a kid and now you've got, you've got this expectation or you're, you're, you've got this thing where it's like, okay, I expect now that I have to have this thing. 
And uh, for better or for worse, right, there it's, it's manipulation on some level. But if we think about expectations in terms of maybe the profession of architecture, right? I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if the honeycomb, the, the uh, uh, expectations set up by any of these jingles or anything are, are detrimental to kids, society, mm, our teeth, you know, oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. But what are, and I'm asking this because we, we talked about this a little bit on clubhouse this morning. And for those of you that are out here that have no idea what I'm talking about when I say clubhouse, uh, every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, we start the Context and Clarity conversation on the Clubhouse app. And so Randy joined us uh, this morning on Clubhouse, and we started talking about expectations, setting, managing, understanding expectations. And one of the things that you said was that the expectations set by firms are not necessarily having a positive impact on the profession of architecture. Um, did I, did I hear that right? Yeah. I mean, I think part of it was, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make and, and I was, I wasn't going to disparage one profession over the other. Cause I see this yeah, the yeah, same yeah. In, in with the, uh, with engineering firms as well. I, I don't think that um, they really do a good job. And in, in a lot of instances of managing, especially the expectations of the new people coming in and joining the firm, meaning that they don't always paint the best picture of what to expect. It's like, Hey, we, we're mm. just excited. We're just excited to have you. And then it's kind of, that's it, that's it. And yeah. the firms that have, have really taken pains to, you know, write out the most thoughtful job description, mm -hmm. um, characterize the challenges, the highs and lows that this individual is going to experience typically have the most success, especially with onboarding and bringing in new, new talent in the design industry space, regardless of what your your area of, of architecture is. And uh, I think that that's one of the, that's one of the few areas that design firms could always improve upon. I mean, any, any company for that matter can, right? Cause I talk to people all the times and all the time and they're telling me, Oh, you know, what I was told when I joined the company and what I'm experiencing now are two totally different things. And right. well, why is that? It, a lot of it is because that company just failed in the area of really communicating to that person, what their expectations should be here. How, here's how things are going to go. You know, I'm always still blown away to this day that when you interact with companies and it's still not communicated to people when, you know, there is going to be a, a review or if they're going to mm -hmm. have a review and what that looks like. And so I just find it interesting that we're still struggling with that. And and I don't think it's just a, a design industry problem. I think it's a bigger oh, right. problem that we have because yeah. um, I don't want, please, I don't want anybody to hear me that I'm just picking <laughs> on the design industry, but I've been around long enough to see enough to say, okay, we should learn from some of our mistakes and try to course correct where possible. But I do think that firms, there's still a lot of room for growth in that area of managing the expectations of people when they join your company and become a part of the culture of, of what you're trying to grow and to build. So, Yeah. yeah and, and I guess maybe we should set the context for everybody that's in the audience as well, um, because this is the day of the week that we stream out to all the places on the internet. Um, so if this is your first time joining Context and Clarity, first of all, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, but the uh, our, our audience will be made up uh, probably largely in part by architects. So um, we'll talk about some things. Randy may say some things and make some references that that may be quote unquote about architecture. But almost every single conversation that we have, whether it's with Randy or any other guests, they're almost always applicable across all types of industries, all types of professions. So if, if you're tuning in and you say, hey, I'm an attorney, there's something, there's going to be something, a great takeaway out of this conversation today for you, even though it may be couched in design firm or architect or something like that. Um, and so that's, if you, if you hear the term architect or architecture or, or design or, uh, don't, don't let that scare you because there's, uh, what we, what we really search for here, the clarity part of context and clarity is to, is to try to dig down and find those truths that are, that are applicable, uh, across all, all types of, uh, uh scenarios. So, 
um, with that, you know, we, we started out talking about, you started out talking about this employer employee relationship and those expectations, but it's also, it extends beyond the, the walls, right? Um, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people that are watching or listening in right now have clients or customers or of some point. So there's expectations on that side as well, right? Yeah, it's 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 there, but you know, I'm I'm, a little, I'm just going to back up one second because internally okay. within your organizations, uh, people have a hard time managing expectations with their peers, mm-hmm. with their colleagues, with their direct reports, and a lot of that a lot of that has to deal with uh, challenges in leadership when it comes to managing and maintaining mm-hmm. expectations and creating clear lines of understanding in terms of what's expected. You know, when I do leadership training around the country, a lot of times we tell people, listen, as a leader, your your whole goal is to work yourself out of a job, right? By creating opportunities for other people to step into what you do. But they can never do that if you don't articulate to them what it takes to get to that point. And my problem is within a lot of firms, people think that a lot of this happens through osmosis or that, that they'll just figure it mm-hmm. out. Or, you know, you, right. you hear the old, I mean, and everybody, there's people here I know of, of, of different generations, but you get that whole vibe of, well, you know, I had to figure it out when I got here in 78. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you're, you're, you know, you young whippersnapper, you're going to have to figure it out too, and you'll be the better for it. And I'm like, no, that's just not how this is done. It's not. <laughs> well, you, you- you know the reason they're saying that is because they've because been there since seventy eight and they still haven't figured it out. Exactly. <laughs> and, and and nobody has ever taken the time to write anything down about this is yeah. how we do things. Cause and, and I'm gonna go off on a tangent here really quickly, but yeah. it's one of the reasons why there is I have a real concern for the design industry from a knowledge transfer perspective mm-hmm. because they haven't even set that up properly. And right. you've got all these gray haired uh, design leaders and people that have forgotten more than most of the young people that mm-hmm. have just gotten into, into the profession will ever know, they're not laying a foundation and setting these guys up for guys and gals up for success for the future because nobody's transferring all of that, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40 years of experience that they've had that's invaluable. And, and so we're missing out. And so, you know, that's just, that's a whole nother issue. But again, managing expectations takes its, uh, takes its shape in many forms within an organization. So if I'm on a, if I'm a PM, uh, APM or a senior project manager, and I've got, you know, five people reporting directly to me, I need to be sure that I'm articulating what we're trying to do on this project, what we're trying to do with each other, what my expectations are with, uh, with you know, everybody on the team and how we're going to get through this together as one cohesive unit. It's not just me up here and everybody else down there and we'll kind of all figure it out and come together when there's a fire to put out. That's, that's not when that should happen. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that's the whole idea. But then, yes, you t- it, once you, re- you step outside of the organization, and you start interacting with the client, interacting with stakeholders in the community that you serve in. Yes, there are there are always going to be expectations to be managed, and how you handle those expectations, I think, a lot of times will bear out the standing that your company, that your organization, that you have in that community that you serve. And it also it it it, it means repeat business. Um, it means. Mm-hmm. Uh, being shortlisted on new projects. I mean, all of that plays into it, but a lot of that comes out of managing the expectations of those clients. And and so that that's a it's it's a huge process. There's so much work involved, and almost it almost hurts my head when I think about it because a lot of times the, you guys got enough on your plate as, as it is designing great things, but there there's this other facet of what we do or what you guys do as design professionals that can't be ignored. And I think that that part of it is, you know, when you talk about the managing expectations with clients and stakeholders, a lot of, a lot of that uh, is informed by, by active listening, but mm. active listening is also any, any, any internal relationships and interactions that you have are also informed by active listening. So there's this like, there's this challenge that we struggle with because most of us are not good listeners. I'm raising my hand and I'm sure you guys will agree. I mean, we all, we are, we're all there from time to time. Sometimes we're really good. Sometimes we're not. And, uh, it's, it's one of those things where you, you almost have to make sure that listening muscle is tuned in 
and strengthened and ready to be used in order to, you know, step out and do manage the expectations that you're going to have of people that are around you, whether they report to you or whether you're trying to sell them on why they should hire your firm to do work. Well, let's, let's talk about that active listening for a minute, because I, I think, you know, I love the way that this all, all kind of culminates and, you know, it's all tied up in a big ball of yarn or something. I don't know what the analogy is, but w- you talked about the repeat clients and the short list. And this morning, uh, somebody on clubhouse was, I think it was Ryan was talking about, uh, serving your clients. And of course we could ap- apply the same, I think to, uh, the young employee or something like that. How do we, if, if we don't know what the expectations are, we can't meet them. Right. So what, what's, what's the best route to learning what those expectations are? What, how do we know that this great design, as you mentioned, this great design, whether it's a building or whatever it is that we're doing, how do we know that that is really what our clients need? How do we find, how do we, how do we get to that point of active listening? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny because that's one of the things that I always talk about. And one of the things that we have to learn um, when, especially when we go into those meetings with clients is, is we've got to, I know we know a lot and, and most of the people here have gotten advanced degrees and have done things that are worthy of, of um, recording on the wall because you guys have done amazing designs, but you know, you almost have to just take the time to say, you know what, I'm going to hear and I'm going to, to a fault, let this person tell me everything about what they're trying to do. I want to hear the why behind this building being built, not yeah. just what they want, right? I mean, a lot of times it's, you got to look at the bigger picture here. Why, why is this being, because a lot of times if you know the why behind something, whenever cost overruns and, and uh, change orders and all kinds of other things come up, you can always circle back to that why if it's big enough and and uh, and it's something that is in the minds of the the client if it's something that's truly important to them. And I think a lot of times design professionals tend to gloss over some of that stuff because they, they you know they want to quickly show the client that they can meet their needs by designing something that's really amazing. But there's some other things that we need to be hearing there. So when we talk about you know managing expectations, a lot of that plays into just understanding where the client is coming from. Do we, do we, do we have all the right questions that we need to ask this client before we actually sit down with them? What, what are they, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? I mean, there, there are a number of things that, um, you know, that's, that design professionals uh, run into or situations that, if they had just taken some time to pause and reflect before getting into that, uh, especially with interacting with a client, they would be better prepared. And so one of the things that I always recommend in terms of working with a client specifically, and especially when you go to those meetings, is, is to actually just err on the side of, of, of not talking much at all uh, and, and really letting, letting the client just bear all their soul and all in terms of what they're trying to do, because a lot of times you'll, you'll understand. And then at, at, there are points within that conversation where you can gently adjust the client's expectations about what's possible based on your experience um, and what you've been able to do in the past. And then also what, you know, physics will allow. Right. Because I mean, there's always those issues that come up where it's like, yeah, can't we do this? And it's like, no, that's not possible. And you know, it's not possible, but you don't want to, you don't want to like in your first meeting, tell the client, no, right. It's like, no, I'm trying to tell the client yes on everything. So we can kind of figure this out because this is a relationship that I want to have for the long term. But I just think that we need to really work at that process of just allowing the client to fully articulate what they're trying to accomplish and then at, at some point in time, they will come up for air and then you're able to step in and say, okay, I hear everything that you're saying. 
here are my thoughts about all these things. Here are some things that I think are totally possible to accomplish and achieve. Here are some things that I think we may have a challenge with. And here's why, because we tried this in the past and it just didn't work or that the type of building that you want to have built is, I mean, you know, I could go on with a, a million different permutations of what that conversation would look like. But I, I think it's, it's, it's as, as design professionals, it's us talking less and letting the client talk a lot more about what they what they hope for. And I could take, I could take that same focus back to a hiring manager talking to a young starry eyed architect that wants to come in and work for your firm. You know, don't, don't, you could tell them everything you, you want to about the firm, but I think you should also learn everything that you can about the individual. And I've been told a lot of times, and even just get, glancing over some of the comments that I see come across the screen, you know, it's still not happening, but that's that's where you you just have to give that person an opportunity to talk, and that's where the active listening comes into play. And if it, it will serve you well, if you practice that active listening, if you learn how to um, not daydream in the middle of the conversation, um, <laughs> how not to because um, you know, I mean, it, it's and it's it's a you know, you laugh, but it's 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 no, I, it's true because it's hard not to start daydreaming sometimes. I mean, for me, but yeah. what is, I was going to ask you, what can you say? What is active listening so that we all have the same idea of what that is? So listening when I, so, okay. So there's a difference between listening and hearing. And when you're actively listening, you're listening with, you know, we hear with our ears, we listen with our heart and with our head. And it's a, it's a little bit different. So there's a different connection there as far as active listening. So you almost internalize something. You know, chickens have great hearing. <laughs> chickens can hear a, a, a bucket of feed. You shake in a bucket of feed a half a mile away if you're on a farm. I mean, they can hear really well, but they can't listen. And there is a significant <laughs> difference there. And so when you think of active listening, active listening is the, the proactive approach to having a conversation with somebody and being able to follow everything that they're sharing with you and have intelligent responses to give them when and where necessary. And sometimes those responses are nothing more than an affirmative nod. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Yep. And acknowledgement because all that's a signal that you send to the other party that says, oh, okay, he's not tuned out. He's listening to what I just told him about the fact that I was helping my mother up the stairs and she fell and I was really just distraught over this. And, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of go on and on and I'm thinking of the worst case scenario in the world. But you get the idea here is that you want to continue to engage somebody. And some of the, way that, the ways that you engage them are... Um, are, are, you know, from an active listening perspective are, you know, are sometimes nonverbal, you know, it's just the acknowledgement. And then sometimes it's go on and then what happened and then what happened. And then, you know, and so, so, so tell me more about this. You want to engage and understand, um, you know, what people are saying. And yeah, somebody actually asked is with active listening, isn't it important to restate what you are hearing? And yes, that is important to acknowledge. So what I hear you saying is, and then the person can say, no, that's not what I said. And then so maybe you weren't listening to me, but or maybe they could say, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying, Elizabeth. That's uh, I'm glad you were listening. So, you know, and then they feel affirmed by that. And a lot of times with active listening, you know, you can talk to anybody, any one of us, every I guarantee you, every person here has had many conversations with somebody else where you knew they were phoning it in. And that they really weren't, all they were waiting for was their turn to talk. Right. And so it's just like, it's like, okay, Jeff, you could talk, you, you're going to, you're going to drop, you're going to drop some real great knowledge. And then I, I don't really care because I have something to say. I'm just waiting. You're taking up the space that I need to share what I need to say. Right. And, and that is the challenge that, um, that we face. And, and that, that is a real problem in, um, in, in the in the workplace uh, is 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 just learning proper listening skills. First of all, being able to identify the listening sins, and then understanding what are active listening skills and how do we you know how do we employ those on a regular basis? How to be a minimal encourager? How to you know to ask the right questions? How to just let a person talk? 
-hmm. without actually, without doing anything, but just letting them talk in a way where they know you're listening and they just proceed to continue to share until they don't have anything else to share. And then they'll tell you, okay, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to me, and, and I know we've got a question. I don't mean to step all over it, but I'm going to anyway. Um, <laughs> we'll get, we'll get to that question down there, but, um, because I, I think this manifests itself a lot, right? Whether we're talking to, whether it's a podcast interview. I mean, I listen to some podcasts and I, I want to, I want to say, uh, you know, through, through my earbuds back to the person that's doing the interview, it's like, wait a minute, you know, get, get off of your agenda and actually have this conversation. Sometimes it is in the office. Sometimes it's, it's with the client. Um, but I think a lot of times we get into a situation and it's obvious that someone has an agenda in this conversation and they're just trying to work through the agenda. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not about what you're saying and us collaborating and working this out. It's about, okay, we're going to get this answer and we're going to go to my next question, whether it has anything to do with your last answer or not. And then we're going to get to the next one, whether it has anything to do. And, and I, I don't know if I'm just more sensitive to, to that or, but, but that in, in my mind, it plays out like that a lot. Yeah, it does. And, and it's really painful too. I think, you know, when, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm the first person to raise my hand to say that I have been guilty of not being an active listener oh, sure. yeah, and yeah. only, you know, trying to get out what I have to say, because what mm -hmm. I have to say is important. You should know that. And mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, none of us are more important than anyone else. And I think it's just the more that we take the time to listen to each other and not talk over each other, the better off that we'll be. And so um, I think that is, you know, that's, that's a real, that's the, that's the real deal. And, and I would say maybe over the last four or five years, I have learned um, a new skill in terms of the importance of silence and embracing it, especially when I like to talk, because that's something that I do. And one of the things was when I came back to doing podcasting, like you said, Jeff, I would hear and I would cringe when I would hear people interviewing somebody and they, they just drop like the greatest nugget ever. I mean, it was almost like it's like when a pitcher throws you a lob and you're like, you know what, I'm about to knock this out of the park. But he, he doesn't he doesn't do it. He just swings and misses because he's got something else he has to share. And yeah. it's it's the most frustrating thing. And people hear it all the time and the mark of a good not that we're talking about it, but the mark of a good interviewer is understanding the person that they're interviewing and hearing what they say and driving the interview off of the responses that they give. Yeah. Those are the those are the most natural conversations to listen to. And I could listen to them all day long. And, and I mean, you know, people like Larry King and others that would, were so informed by um, by the by the person that they were interviewing that they didn't run from a script. They just, they just basically went in the direction that the person took them in. And so I think that's, I think that's really important. And, and asking good questions makes a, makes a big difference as mm -hmm. well. I'll tell you this one story and we can move on, but um, uh, there's a guy named Cal Fussman. He's a writer for Esquire mm -hmm. magazine. He also has a podcast. Cal tells a story about um, when he got to interview Gorbachev and, and for the longest time he was, you know, pining for this interview and they finally gave it to him and they were like, all right, you've got five minutes. He ended up being in that room with Gorbachev for about 45 minutes, and it was all because of the, the questions that he asked him and how he interacted with him and, and his ability to, to, um, to, to, to be present with Gorbachev, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you got to think, you I mean, you know, one of the most powerful men in the world, um, he deals with re reporters all the time and reporters are always asking the same pat questions over and over again. And, <laughs> you know, Cal went in there and asked a guy, he asked Gorbachev about the, the memory that sticks with him the most about um, his time with growing up with his parents. And Gorbachev just went off on this whole thing about going to get um, ice cream on Sunday afternoon. 
And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a crazy idea, but when you think about it, it's like, if you ask the right questions, if you stop for a second and assess the situation, you'd be surprised what people will tell you. And, um, it was to the point where every time that Gorbachev's handlers came in to try to rush them out, he was like, you know, he was like, go away, go away. I'm, I'm talking here. And, uh, it, it, so, you know, Cal got a real kick out of that, but it, it taught him a very valuable lesson of how important, um, you know, being present in the moment when you're with somebody and making them feel like the most important person in the room. Bill Clinton has that ability as well. I, I uh, in a former life, I worked in the, um, I, I covered the Clinton White House at ABC News and, um, uh, People would tell you, they would say, listen, I, I don't know what it is. This guy's a leader of the free world. But when you're in a room with him, it feels like nobody else is there but you and him. Now, you can have jokes all you want about other things and being in the room with the wrong people or whatever. But I think it's a very interesting, it's very telling about his mm -hmm. his ability. I mean, Bill Clinton's. I, I, I respect him for being an amazing speaker. Um, I mean, a guy can command a room. I've seen him speak to a thousand. I've seen him speak to a hundred people. And, and regardless, he always captured, had the room. And but, but his practice is actually something that most of us could implement and utilize on a regular basis. We just don't don't choose to do it because we're constantly in our minds. I think moving from one thing to the next too fast. But mm -hmm. people will tell you. People will tell me, Matt. You know, I he remembered my dog's name and all this other stuff. I mean, this guy's meeting thousands of people, and he just he just you know some of it is yeah. I, I he, you know he had he has he's a great memory, highly intelligent individual. But at the same time, his grandfather in Arkansas taught him to be present when you're with people. And I think that's a really valuable lesson that we can all learn from, that when you're in the moment, no matter what you're doing, like right now, this is the most important thing going on for me. I'm not checking email. I'm not doing a bunch of other stuff. I, this is it. I'm here with you guys. This is what we're doing. And a lot of times, because of the way that technology has creeped into our lives, into our existence, we have, we have um, allowed those to water down our ability to stay and connect it with people in, I think, a more profound way. And I, I think the society is the worst for that. That's just more of a commentary that we're all yeah. struggling with. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just as guilty as the next, but I have learned, I've learned some skills to overcome that so that I can be present in the moment because it does make a difference. Hmm. I, I think there's, I, I don't think the importance of that can be uh, overstated. Um, I was having a conversation right before we came on today with somebody that will have an interview soon with a prospective client. And it's a project type they've never worked on before. But that particular client, client group reached out to them and said, hey, we want you to talk to us about this project. And it's a short list situation. There's there's a at least three firms involved here. But um uh, as we talked about it, my my advice was the best thing that you can do because there's this question about what needs to be in the presentation, and you know we don't have any work examples to show. And and my advice was, you know, I know you feel the pull of that presentation, but the best thing that you can do is turn that into a conversation, even to the point of as you walk in the room to sit down, ask them maybe throw them off a little bit by asking them, okay, a little bit more backstory is involved, I guess. Um, they had done a project previous. They didn't like the architect. They didn't like the the contractor, et cetera. So this is another time around. So as you walk in the room, as everybody's getting ready to sit down before they're able to establish themselves and, and say, okay, why are, why are you the architect for this job? Before they can even sit down and say, hey, can can I ask you a few questions before we get started so that we can start this process of having the conversation and make it very clear that you're here to listen to them. And the best thing that would ever happen is if you never get to a presentation, it just, it's just this conversation where um, it's going to be a give and take of ideas, but mainly you listening to what they, what they have to say um, and find out. You know, why didn't they like um, the other architect, the, the contractor, all, all those things that happened with the past projects? You know, why are you reconsidering? Why are you, why'd you reach out to us? 
right? And and basically get into this this conversation so that you can l- let them lay out what their expectations are. And then hopefully in the process, you start to illustrate some of the benefits of working, working with you. Hey, we're going to, we're going to have these conversations. I'm going to hear your needs and hear your expectations. And we're going to go through this process together, et cetera. You know, all, all, all the strong points that I think they, they do have in their, uh, in their corner. But, um, you know, what, what you're saying right now really, um, I don't know if they're out there listening to this or will listen to this or not, but I hope that they hear this because I think what you're saying right now would really inform the process that they need to go through here in a, in a week or so. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, there, there's so many, there's so much that we can learn from, from, from taking the time to kind of check our egos at the door yeah. and uh and sit down and 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 really talk with somebody and understand where they where they're coming from. And I know it gets a little hokey. I always love bringing up Renee Brown because, you know, Brene gives it to you straight. No chaser. It's like, listen, if you, you really want to know what somebody else is like, you got to look in their eyes and understand them. And I've done that with clients. And it can be hugely uncomfortable but it can be tremendously rewarding. And so it's like you, you almost wonder, okay, when you look at folks that are in your office, who's who's willing to get uncomfortable to get comfortable, right? right? If that makes sense. Yeah. And, and for most of us, getting uncomfortable means kind of bearing yourself out there, A, maybe not um, – defending being defensive about mm-hmm. anything that's happened historically because you know you you're trying to put your best foot forward and listen everybody makes mistakes and i think the 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 mark of a good firm and the mark of a good leader is somebody that can acknowledge and move on and not allow that to you know kind of be an mm-hmm. albatross around their neck and uh and those are those are things that i think that we need to work on um collectively because it will It'll just give us a better standing when we are working both with our team, because humility is everything, but then also working with clients or potential clients, because, you know, they'll always know that we've got their back. And, and that's, you know, that's the thing to me that, that that's why the importance of kind of managing the expectations of what a client has. What, what are their expectations? Maybe they're may, way different than what I thought they were. Mm-hmm. And I need to... Right be quiet and listen to what they're saying so I can understand that and, and kind of deal with it. So, yeah. um, Yeah. And that, and 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 Catherine, that's a great segue back to the question that I've just been, (laughs) been burying for about 20 minutes now. What's the difference? Managing versus meeting. Managing expectations and meeting expectations. That was Tim Hill because I have a special Facebook knowledge. Yes. I mean, so what, I think that's, I, you know, for me, you know, it, it could, could potentially be a little bit of semantics, but I also think that, um, you know, when you're managing expectations, um, that means that um, those expectations could constantly be evolving. Whereas I, I think if you're meeting, meeting an expectation, it, it, in my mind, it seems like it could be fixed 100%. Mm-hmm. Right. So it might be this idea of meeting is when you're meeting a fixed expectation versus managing expectations where, you know, there's some there's some movement there. There's some wiggle room there. Right. You know, because nobody you know, when you deal with you know, that's the thing about when we deal with clients, it's it, it can it can get messy. Um, there are highs, there are lows, there are a lot of different things there. It's like meeting an expectation is, hey, you're going to build this building and it's going to be this high, it's going to be this wide, it's going to, you know, there's there's cer- certain things that are very fixed within that within that guideline and framework. But when it ter- comes time to managing expectations, well, things change, right? How do you how do you meet expectations or, or how do you meet expectations with an employee that has just recently lost a parent and all of a sudden it has mm. taken them out of their game? Well, you almost have to change and, and figure out how you can uh, deal with that employee now, given this, you know, loss of a parent and, and how that's impacting them and how it's impacting their work. And so that's where, where in my mind, when you say meet, I think fix when I, when I think managing, I think flexibility. 
And I think that there, there's, there is a little bit of difference there. So, you know, it's not like a tomato tomato thing. I think there are some, there's some different understandings there as far as that's, that's concerned. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's good. And I think maybe, um, Michelle's question is probably too long to get up on the screen. There you go. No, it's not too long to get on the screen. <laughs> I think they've increased their character limit over the last week. All right. <laughs> Yay. So how, how do we listen oh, so to sorry, it? So says, <clears throat> sorry, that was my right. job. Randy, how do we listen to a client who is talking about uh, how they want to do something, but we just can't do what they want to do without telling them that's a crazy idea and you can't afford it, but. Yeah, I think. I, um, I need this one for tomorrow. So give yeah. me a good answer. All right. Well, I mean, that's, thank you, Michelle, for that question. I think part of it is, is, um, you know, part of it is just, is just allowing the client to lay down all of their ideas. Right. And, and some ideas, some clients throw out are crazy, just like some ideas that some of your colleagues throw out are crazy. And so I think it's just, a lot of times people just want to be heard. It's not so much that they have this crazy idea that they, they want to see happen 100%. Sometimes it's just a factor of them wanting to be able to share the idea. Because mm -hmm. we also aren't always privy to what's happening in the back rooms of our clients, right? And our client might, they, they, they could have been in the back room, Michelle, say, yeah, you know, I don't know that this, that, you know, Jim, I don't think that's a really good idea. I don't think that's even something they can do. Well, I really want to try it. So let's press this and push this and see if they can can do it. And then if they can't and we get enough pushback, then maybe we'll course correct or we'll go up with option B. A lot of times, you know, we don't even know what they're dealing with, but, but if we allow them to talk enough, option B is going to present itself anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey guys, listen, Michelle, I know this seems like it's crazy. And I know you guys have done some amazing things for us in the past, but you know, we really would love to do it this way. But in, 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 in if we can't, then we, we have another option that we, we would like you guys to potentially consider as well. And only that will only reveal itself if you allow them to really to talk about the situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and also I think that real clients will always appreciate you when you let them know that, hey, this is not something that is feasible and here's why. It's not that you're, you know, throwing their idea under the bus or you're saying they're stupid for even bringing it up in the first place. It's just that, you know, there are a lot of other things, there are a lot of other factors to consider. That's why, you know, that's, and that's why I always tell design professionals, listen, you guys, you guys create the built environment. I mean, we, we couldn't do, we couldn't function in society with, without the stuff that you guys do on a regular basis. So of course I'm going to defer to you. I may, as a client, I may, I may, I may push you some, but I'm going to defer to you because this is what you do on a daily basis. And you have to figure out a way to remind people of that. And I think a, a lot of the way that you do that mm. is how you engage with the client, potential client, and how you interact with them, and also how you let them kind of share what's going on with them and what they want to do. So uh, I think that's okay. And, and, and again, affordability is always going to be a factor in every project. So that's not like it's something new. It's like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's rare when a client's in, hey, I want you to build this and, you know, the sky is the limit. Money is no ob object. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, and you're sitting there like, oh, my gosh, you know, you're thinking about all the people that, um, you know, that uh, that would that you could bring on the project and all the extra money you can make. But, you know, those things happen. So I, I would I would just encourage you to allow the client to. um you know, just to, just to let them kind of talk about it. Cause I, I bet you uh, the client, you know, short of you saying, Hey, this is just not going to work. The clients probably said, you know, they've probably had a plan B and come up with mm -hmm. other ideas that they think would be a pro would be appropriate. And, and even if they haven't, then that just leads you to have a really good conversation. And that's when you really have to put on your hat and say, listen, here's what's possible. And then within that, is there anything that you see here from, from what we are proposing that, that, you know, looks like what you were thinking? And you'll only get that by affording them the opportunity to really talk and to share mm -hmm. um, their, you know, to share themselves about what they're really are trying to do. Yeah, I like that. You know, it's, it's funny what Chris Voss is whispering in my ear right now. 
right? You're uh, familiar with Chris Voss and absolutely. never, yeah. yeah <laughs> there, there's his book behind me, so yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's so much of of what you're talking about, what we're talking about, that just hmm. it screams well, negotiation. negotiation. Yeah, totally. To- I mean, negotiation is all throughout. I mean, anything that we do. I mean, I'm gonna go to. I'm gonna negotiate with my wife tonight to go to my son's soccer game so that I don't have to go home and wash the dishes or whatever. So, <laughs> you know, we'll we'll figure it out. I, I'll 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 make a case for why why I want to do it. But we, we're negotiating everything. So, uh, the minute that you don't want to get into that, or I hear people say about you know negotiations feel dirty and I don't want to have to do that. It's I mean, you're actually missing out. I, th- I think we're more alive when we're actually able to go out and negotiate things. And, um, you know, and, and get people, I don't, I mean, it's not, it's not the gamification of life, but I see it as an opportunity mm-hmm. for us to, to persuade people to see things the way that we see them on, on many levels. Right. And, and from the perspective of being a design professional, you want to persuade your clients to see things from your perspective when it comes to, um, what's going to be cost effective, what's going to make the most sense in terms of building, in terms of long-term, um, uh, survivability and, and, and something that's going to be around that, you know, maybe your client's children will appreciate from, uh, you know, from a foundational perspective. So, you know, I think it's important for us to, to kind of think about that and, um, and not discount that at all. Yeah. I, I know we're swinging up close to the top of the hour. Um, and this may not be the smoothest of segues here, but there's there's one thing that I want to get to that I think is really important. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about these expectations. And like I said, we, we set the topics for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday up around the idea of being the best, whatever that means, right? And part of my thinking in that was, well, if we're talking about expectations, we don't even know what the best is if we don't know what the expectations are. Those, they have to go together. But I know there's something else that you talk about and you focus on a lot, and it's it's that idea of 1% improvement. And, you know, and that shows up in James Cleary's work and other places as well. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, being the best – whatever that means, being the best you, you talk about personal development as well as leadership development. So uh, can you spend a minute or two talking about the importance of 1%? Yeah. You know, and I appreciate you, you mentioning that that's kind of the standard and it's, I kind of wish um, I just had them framed, but I have a a huge sign that I usually have in my office that says get 1% better every day. Um, that came from 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 James Clear. James Clear got it from Darren Hardy, uh, who wrote the book Compound Effect. Um, and Darren Hardy got it from a bunch of people, including Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar. There are a lot of there are a lot of um, motivational speakers that talk about that. You know, it's it's you know the road to improvement happens one step at a time. Mm-hmm. And when when we all think of um, when I se- when I tell people get one percent better, and I have T-shirts that I don't have it on today, but I have T-shirts that I wear. I give these T-shirts out to the guests on my podcast, but it's just a simple, subtle reminder that as human beings, um, this idea of taking these giant leaps of, of growth. I mean, while they do happen from time to time, it's those small incremental steps that really get you from where you are now to where you envision yourself being in the future where, where and whatever that is for you. Cause it's, it's going to be different for you, Catherine. It's going to be different for you, Jeff, th- than it is for me, but each one of us can get there by just, you know, getting 1% better every day. And if we think about the compound effect of, you know, taking a penny and just adding it each day, or if I gave you $3 million right now, or if I gave you, a penny, but what that penny had was the ability to compound each day. So each day you'd get a, an extra penny and you keep adding yeah. to it and that's going to grow. Um, that, that to me is, is, uh, I mean, Einstein said it's one of the most, it's most, most powerful things he's ever seen is compound growth. Mm-hmm. And we can have that physically in our, you know, in, in, in our DNA and how we operate if we just think of it. So it might mean that you hate to read. But you're going to force yourself to read five pages a day, every day, just to improve. Before you know it, you've read a book, then you've read another, then you, then another. Then, then it's like, oh, my gosh, 
I hadn't read any books since college and now I'm reading, you know, three books a month or whatever. And, you know, it, it, it's the same way with, um, you know, working out, going to the gym, mm -hmm. just checking that box off on that calendar every single day as a reminder that you are there and that you achieve something and that you're moving forward. Because anytime that you do that, you have no choice but to get better. Right. And that's why the whole 1% better. And, and I mean, of course, you know, James Clear took it to a whole nother level with Atomic Habits. It's an amazing mm -hmm. book. I've read it like six times. He's an amazing guy and uh, definitely somebody worth, um, uh, worth, uh, worth, worth reading the book and following him, getting his newsletter. But, you know, he started out the same way. I mean, he, if you read his story, he started, nobody knew who James Clear was. He just, he would create a blog post on a regular basis and just put it out. And he was methodical about it. And that's what you have to be. If you want to get it better at whatever you do, whether you're a young design professional and you're trying to show um, your boss or show your firm how, how valuable you are, just work on yourself every single day. And you'll see that, you know, you'll see that consistent improvement and growth. And of course, we know Mr. Toyota called it Kaizen when you talk about that consistent improvement. So yeah. that's that it's it's all the same thing, but it's just this idea that that um, you know, where where we want to be is actually really not that far off from where we are right mm -hmm. now, but it just takes those incremental steps to get there. It's not by we never get there through giant leaps. It's always incremental right. steps. So yeah. 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 That's also a great callback. We we had Seth Godin as a guest several weeks ago. And yeah, that's exactly. that's that's one of the things that he talked about as well. And his blog post is a great um, example of that as well. It's, you know, I, I forget exactly how he said it, but it's, you've got to put in the work every day. And, and I mean, at least my one hero. good going to come out. He's yeah. my hero because he, re, he, re, he taught me about shipping it. And I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've literally followed Seth since the beginning. Like I remember getting his emails way back in the day and yeah. you know of course the blog but he has he has consistently and and some of his stuff is is like oh okay it's like all right i read that that's like 60 seconds that i'll never get back in my life again but it's okay because then yeah. the next day he's like batting a thousand and and that's mm -hmm. just that's the way life is though right i mean we're, nobody is yeah. batting nobody's doing it i mean you know uh, what is what's his name um, from the Red Sox? He, he batted 400. And I mean, it was, it was something that's basically has not been seen since. And, and that's still, uh, you know, four out of 10 times at bat that he actually got a right. hit. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah. you know, there's so much that's required there. And I heard you talk earlier about, you know, athletes about, you know, where, what it takes for them to get to the highest pinnacle of achievement. And it, you know, everybody loves to talk about how Michael Jordan is the greatest, but nobody would ever want to go through what he went through to get there. And yeah. that's that. And, and, and everything that he achieved, it was just incrementally better each day. And even right. to the point where when he left the, the Bulls and went to the Wizards, he was still outperforming guys that were 10 years younger than him. That was the crazy <laughs> right. thing because yeah. he put the work in. And so everybody here has to put the work in. You've got to ship You've got to write, you've got to draw, you've got to create every single day. Yeah, that, that's, that's excellent advice. We all, we all need to, I need to take that advice. So thank you for that. Uh, I know that uh, there's still some questions out there, uh, still some comments out there, but we've made it to the top of the hour and we've got to wrap this up. I mean, we've we can, made it. We, we've made Wait it. <laughs> We, we, uh, we could keep going for hours, but we're going to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, Randy, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us today. Uh, it's been very enlightening. And uh, I hope, number one, for anybody out there, uh, if you're not familiar with Randy Wilburn, go to encouragebuildgrow.com. I think I have that right. And, and they can uh, find me on LinkedIn too. They can connect. That's like one of the best places to connect with me is I'm just all over LinkedIn. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. Connect with Randy on LinkedIn. Check out his Encourage, Build, Grow podcast. It's a good one. It's focused on leaders in the A&E world. Um, he has some other uh, properties out there as well, but uh, maybe start with Encourage, Build, Grow and uh, learn a little bit more about Randy Wilburn. And, and uh, you're going to hear a lot of everything that we talked about uh, to, here today. So that's a great thing. So Randy, really appreciate you being here. 
Uh, everybody you. else that's thank out there in the audience, thank you. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for showing up to these conversations. Uh, I really do hope that uh, these are important conversations for for the profession and, and for the industry. So um, it's great to have all of you along and being a part of these conversations because without that, at some point it would just be me staring at the screen talking to myself and nobody wants that. So uh, Catherine, thank you. Thanks for having me on again. No, it's fun. I have so many things to say. Maybe I'll be able to say them when we go off the air. I wrote them all down so I, I, I wouldn't forget. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks, well, guys. Appreciate if anybody, it. Yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to buy that backstage pass so you can uh, find out what Catherine's going to say once we're off the air. <laughs> credit Never card uh, <laughs> put your credit card number in uh yeah so thank you uh, ted williams someone t- put ted yeah, williams now you're right the red teddy, teddy ball yep. game so yeah yep. so yep all right well with that thank you everybody again appreciate all of you being here i'll be back again tomorrow 4 p.m eastern same bat time same bat channel uh, inside the entree architect community facebook group and tomorrow we'll go back to our mini series on digital and social media for architects. And we're grouping together uh, three things that I, I think they're, they're very similar. They're the, the uh, lead sharing apps is what I'll call them. Thumbtack, Nextdoor, and Home Advisor oh for architects. So uh, we'll talk about that. We love that we'll, subject, Jeff. Oh, yeah, we love them. <laughs> we're, we'll talk about that on Clubhouse tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern and also uh, inside the Facebook group tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. So um, if those are of interest to you, join the conversation tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you then. So with that, everybody, really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great evening. Take care of yourself. Take care of those around you. Stay safe and well, please. Uh, still some crazy stuff going on. So let's, uh, let's keep everybody well and, uh, take a little bit of time to breathe tonight. Come back again tomorrow, rejuvenated and ready to do this again. Thanks everybody. 